And we'll read Ruth chapter 1. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a man of Bethlehem in Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Melon and Chilion. They were Ephrath Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Melon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she arose with her daughters-in-law to return from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the fields of Moab that the Lord had visited his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she was with her two daughters-in-law, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to, to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. And they said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters, why will you go with me? Have I yet sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say I have hope, even if I should have a husband this night, and should bear sons, would you therefore wait till they were grown? Would you therefore refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, for it is exceedingly bitter for me, for your sake, that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. Then they lifted up their voices and wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. And she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth said, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God my God. Where you die, I I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts me from you. And when Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said, No more. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the woman said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Do not call me Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi, when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth, the Moabite, her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab, and they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. Sometimes in life, when it rains, it pours. The Bible pulls no punches on the hardships that can come in life and even promises hardships while under the curse of God because of our sin. But the Bible is not a book about how hard uh, life is. or uh, um, It's not, uh, in a sense, also an inspirational book okay, about how to th uh, think positive thoughts. and uh, It's not a chicken soup for the soul. Okay? Let, me, let me put it that way. Okay? In fact, the small book of Ruth here, it's not even about Ruth. Okay. It's not about Ruth, it's not even about Naomi, nor is it about Boaz. Okay, And let me just say, because a lot of people, there have been rumors about the direction that I will be taking of this book, it is not a book about marriage either, Okay, or how to find a spouse. Rather, the book, it's about a promise. It's a book about a promise. It's about a promise that God made back in Genesis 3.15 to deliver the human race from their sin, from their curse, and from their great enemy, the seed of the serpent, through the seed of the woman. It's about God's hesed, his kindness, 
or loving kindness, which is to say his covenant faithfulness, his covenant love toward his people. Several times in the book, the, the Hebrew word chesed, which is translated as kindness, okay, is used of either the characters uh, in it or of God especially. The book of Ruth is about hope when all hope seems to be gone. It's about kindness in undeserved places. It's about frustration and bitterness in life. It's about faithfulness. But it's not a story about how to make your own hope. Okay? It's a story about real hope. It's not a story about merely how to face life in adverse times, how to be strong when things aren't going your way. Rather, it's a story about what God has done to rescue and to redeem His people from the hardest time. As we go through the book, we're going to look at it in three stages, basically following uh, our outline up here. We're going to look at chapter 1, okay, losing hope, chapters 2 and 3, regaining hope, and then finally in chapter 4, the true hope. So, let's start with losing hope. Uh, sometimes life is just hard, okay, period. <laughs> sometimes life is just hard. Sometimes life just seems to overwhelm you and hit you from all sides, the book of Ruth takes place, according to 1.1, in the days when the judges rule. If you remember last week, the period of judges is a pretty dark time. Okay, uh, it, it was dark as a whole. There was uh, some light, uh, in a sense, during those times. But for the most part, the, the nation of Israel itself was pretty rebellious against God. Okay, you have some light in a few of the judges uh, that were described. But uh, the whole period itself is basically characterized as a time when people did what was right in their own eyes. Okay, not a very nice time to live. Okay, now we have to acknowledge that though the nation as a whole could be under God's covenant curses, there were still faithful individuals who could experience God's blessings. Okay, now we're not exactly sure what uh, exact time period this story takes place, but it seems fair to say that if the Lord brought a famine to the land, that they may have been under God's curses at that point. If you recall the covenant curses pronounced in Deuteronomy 28, we read, But if you will not obey the voice of the Lord your God, or be careful to do all his commandments and his statutes that I command you today, then all these curses shall come upon you and overtake you. Cursed shall you be in the city, and cursed shall you be in the field. Cursed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Cursed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, the increase of your herds and the young of your flock. Cursed shall you be when you come in, and cursed shall you be when you go out. So whatever the case in the land, uh, Elimelech and his wife Naomi, they decide that Judah is basically not the place to be. There's no food there. It's, it's under curse. Okay, So they pack up their kids, their things, and they decide to move to Moab. Moab is roughly uh, southeast across the Dead Sea uh, from, where, uh, from where they're at in Bethlehem. Okay, things apparently are pretty good in Moab. Apparently, there's food there. Okay, they have the only open Taco Bell in the state. Okay, if you want to put it that way. Okay, now, God had previously told the people to be careful who they marry. Okay, the kids, they grew up. Uh, they decided to marry into, into a, a Moabite family. God had told them to be careful who they marry, especially the Canaanite women. But... Moabites are not explicitly mentioned as Canaanites. That is, when we, when we read about all the curses of the, the people that they were supposed to destroy off the land, the Moabites were not explicitly mentioned. Okay? So uh, some commentators think that it may have been okay for these Israelites to marry the Moabites. Others think that they were still breaking faith with God and, and looking for marriage with those who were outside the covenant community. But there was something in the laws of Israel about the Moabites, and that was this. Moab, first of all, Moab was the firstborn son of Lot. Okay, If you remember in the history of Israel, as they were in the wilderness, it was Moab that hired Balaam to curse Israel. In Deuteronomy 23, verses 2 through 6, there is a curse that is placed upon the Moabites up to the tenth generation saying that they cannot enter into the assembly of the Lord because they hired Balaam and because they did not show kindness to Israel when they were in the wilderness. If I remember the story correctly, basically Israel wanted to pass through their land. They didn't want to have anything to do with it. They didn't want to conquer it, nothing. They just wanted to pass through. And the king of Moab said, no, you guys go around. We don't want you here. We don't want anything to do with you guys. And they, they basically made Israel 
go the long way around. Okay, so they didn't show them kindness, and God placed a curse on them up to the tenth generation. Elimelech and his family, they're basically they're treading on dangerous ground heading to Moab in, in this sense here. Okay. Either way, they allowed their sons to marry, and note what happens to Naomi. Okay, and, and Naomi seems to be the main character of the story. That they, if, you, if this was a movie, the camera seems to come back to her all the time. Okay, and look what happens. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite wives. The name of one was Orpah, and yes, that is where we got the mispronoun mispronounced name of Oprah. Okay, that's where she got her name from. Uh, and the name of the other, Ruth. They lived there about ten years, and both Malon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. There you have it. Okay, basically, in five short verses, you have three deaths and one hard life. Three deaths and one hard life. Anybody who's ever lost somebody, only to lose somebody in a short period of time, knows that life can seem pretty overwhelming. One of our members, uh, Niana, she I believe she lost her father, and then she lost a couple of friends right after that, back to back to back. That is hard. That is very, very hard. For this woman, she lost her husband, then her two children, who had not produced any children of their own to perpetuate the family name. Okay, the women, they were barren. Okay, I mean, geez, how hard is life on Naomi right now? She and her family, they fled a famine, expecting to find some relief for a while, but their sojourning turned into, uh, uh, it turned into a remaining, and then it turned into a settling for them, hoping for a better life, and all, uh, all she found was tragedy and calamity. That's all that awaited for her in Moab. Tragedy and calamity. No, no, Naomi has become bereft of all her family, save her barren daughter-in-laws. Okay, and it's not like they were trying to be, you know, or not have kids or anything like that. Okay, a woman in those times was expected to have children. That's how you, you know, that's how the name carried on. That's how you had the family be strong and keep going. But now suddenly, Naomi, she finds her place in a place that she doesn't know. Her identity, her very life had been built basically on her function as a wife, who she was in relation to her husband, who she was in relation to her children. And now that her husband and her kids are gone, she has no idea who she is. She's almost, she's without an identity. She's without an identity. She, she used to be a wife and a mother, but now she's been robbed of those titles and of those functions. She has no idea who she is. Has this ever happened? Have you ever just been so overwhelmed with life that you don't even know who you are because life just hits you and it shocks you? Perhaps it could be losing a family member to death. It could be losing a relationship. It could be losing a job. It could be receiving some ill-timed news. If you, if, if you never have, you know, if, if, if life has never hit you that way, give it a little time. <laughs> I've learned that one. Give it a little time and life has a way of knocking you out. Okay, It has a way of knocking the spirit right out of you. It has a way of taking your dreams from you. It has its own way of crushing you and breaking your heart. And that's basically what's going on with Naomi here. Life has just crumbled down upon her. Plenty of us can identify with her in some ways. And we have to say here, the Bible knows pain. The Bible knows suffering. It doesn't pull any punches. The Bible is not some fairy tale myth book here that tries to you know, present this uh, yellow brick road uh, approach to life that, that uh, you know, everybody's just happy, holy, and healthy and all that kind of stuff. The Bible is very real on human suffering and on human pain. So deciding to return to her homeland, especially after learning that God has given food to Judah again, uh, she, she wants to go home, but she's got her two daughter-in-laws. Okay, She's got her daughter-in-laws that she's responsible for. And as a widow, uh, this, this is a pretty tough position to be in. The laws of her people make provisions for widows, but the Moabite laws didn't. Okay? No, I mean, she had nothing. Nothing except her two daughters-in-laws, and they had nothing. When you give nothing and you add more nothing, you compound nothing and you get a whole lot of nothing. Okay? They had nothing. Seeking the best for her daughters-in-law, uh, they're still of marriageable age. She thinks that it's in their best interest to send them back home. 
you all need to go back home. You know, uh, her life, she feels like, you know, life has ended for her. She's done. She's given all that she can. She lost, okay? Life one, Naomi zero is basically what the score is here. And she's like, look, you all are still, in a sense, you're still in the game. You still have hope. If you can, if you can get a husband, you'll have somebody who can provide for you, somebody who can protect you, somebody who can uh, offer you security for life. But Naomi's like, I can't give you any of these things. If you stick with me... <laughs> you're going to continue to have nothing. Her only hope uh, is basically head back home. Hopefully they can find a way to live in their homeland under its protection. And, uh, 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 you know, that's, that's or Naomi's trying to get back home. Hopefully she can find some protection there and hopefully some of God's blessings. So as she's on the verge of entering her home country, okay, so apparently they've been traveling for a while. And she's coming, it seems, uh, like to the edge or, or the border uh, of Israel around that area, and her daughter-in-laws, they've been kind enough to travel with her thus far, but she turns to them and she says, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, and there's that word, has said, okay, uh, as you have dealt with, with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find rest, each of you, in the house of her husband. So Naomi sees that there's still a chance of the good life for these two women, and therefore she dismisses uh, their obligation to herself. She's like, you know, I, you've, you've been great, Okay, you've walked with me this far, that's awesome, but seriously, uh, and you can put it this way, she's like, seriously, go get a life, I don't have one anymore, I'm done, please go and do something. So, uh, they make an initial, uh, Orpah and Ruth, they make this initial offer, you know, like, no, no, we're going to stay, we're going to stay, and, uh, uh, and it's, if you can picture the scene, okay, there's these three women in the middle of the road, and they're just crying. They're just crying, you know, no, you know, I won't go, you know, and they're just having this little sob fest right there, you know, if you want to put it that way. Uh, you can imagine walking by like, oh, what's, what's going on there? What's their problem? You know, and, and they're crying, and then finally Orpah gives in, and she's basically like, okay, you know, it, she reasons, you know what, it is better, I should go, so I will return. You know, she, uh, Orpah, she kisses Naomi. She decides that it's best to return, to head back home. For Orpah, she basically reasons out that it's better that she return to her own people and to her own gods, to her own culture, to what's familiar to her with the chance to rebuild her life from there. But Ruth, Ruth doesn't come to that same conclusion. Rather, Ruth, she clings to Naomi. And Ruth says, Do not urge me to leave you or to return from following you. For where you go, I will go. And she's saying this with tears. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death departs me from you. Her clinging has a familiar ring to it. Uh, if you remember the story when Jacob was wrestling with the stranger in the middle of the night, that's how Ruth is clinging to Naomi here. She's clinging in, the, in that sort of way. I mean, I, don't, I can't imagine her, well, I can't imagine her literally, but, you know, in particular, she's morally obligating herself to her. She's like spiritually attaching herself to Naomi. Your God will be my God. Now, how did Ruth know about this God? Okay, well, uh, apparently Naomi, had, she must have talked about him a lot. Okay, because she's familiar with some of her, her, uh, this God's ways. Uh, perhaps her character really showed a lot what this God was like. So she's willing, basically, uh, to forsake her future, her people, and her gods to go with Naomi to the God of Naomi's land. Okay, Ruth is making a huge life choice here. You see, the choices that Naomi essentially laid out to Orpah and Ruth were basically this. You either go back to your home, to your gods and your people, and you have a chance and a life again, or you go to no promises of life, no promises of security, just the land of the God of the Hebrews, and that's it. It's, it's essentially uh, God uh, plus nothing, okay? Or, like Orpah, go home and you have everything. That's basically the choices that were laid out here. Go home and you can have everything, a husband, a life, or all you get is God and no promises for anything else. Those were the life choices that were set before these two people. And Ruth decides that she's going to take Naomi's God, the people, and the land. 
Now, this is a very interesting hint in redemptive history because here we see Ruth. She's a Gentile, okay? She's a person outside of the covenant. She's not an Israelite, okay? She's a Gentile. She's a non-Israelite. She's a stranger to the covenant promises of Israel. But here she's clinging to Naomi and she's basically claiming in one sense the same covenant promises made to Abraham that he would be his God and the God of his descendants, that he would make a people out of Abraham for himself, that he would give them a land to dwell in. Those were the promises to Abraham. Had to have a people. To be God to them. Okay? To have the land. How will this fare for her? You know, this is, this is interesting because after all, one does not simply take upon themselves the covenant God. You have to be granted in by God. That is, God is the one who has to do the initiating into the covenant. So this is a really interesting move at this point in redemptive history. Ruth has no right to the covenant promises, but her clinging, again, it also reminds us of someone else who clung in faith, looking for a blessing who had no natural rights to the blessing. Remember, Jacob was not the firstborn. The, uh, the, the rights of the firstborn weren't his. They were Esau's. But Jacob was the one who clung in faith. He's the one who clung to God in faith, and he got them. Ruth demonstrates that same resolve here. Perhaps Ruth recognized that there was no real hope going back to her gods and her people, and she was ready for the God of Israel. But I'm going to come back to her, okay? Camera going back to Naomi. So as Naomi and Ruth, they come into Judah and to Bethlehem. The town is surprised to see Naomi back. Probably some of her old friends, they recognize her. You can see them like, hey, is that, is that Naomi? Is that her name? Hey, I think Naomi's here. Naomi, Naomi, I haven't seen her in years. Oh, my goodness. I thought she was dead. You know, and, and so the whole town is buzzing with news of Naomi's return. Okay, and someone, uh, uh, she hears someone say, hey, is that Naomi? And suddenly Naomi just calls out, and she's like, look. I mean, this is how bad life was for her. She says, don't call me Naomi. Don't call me that name. Uh, uh, Naomi means something like uh, pleasant. Okay? It's like, don't call me that. Really. Okay, if you know what I've been through, don't call me that name. My life has not been pleasant. My life has been anything but pleasant. If you're going to call me something, call me Mara, she says, which means bitter. For the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went away full, and the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So now this woman with the lost identity, now she's... She's clung to a new identity. She's Mara. She's the bitter one. Her life is now going to be characterized by bitterness. Again, the Bible's not holding anything back here. I mean, if you've ever uh, been through this kind of trauma, you almost feel the same way. You almost feel the same way. You, know, you, don't, you don't have a positive outlook on life anymore. You don't want to have a positive outlook on life. You know, you just want to shell up, you just want to, you, you want to clam up, and all of a sudden everything is just doom and gloom when you're hit with this in life. She really has been torn apart. But, and this is, this is crucial to see, in all this, Naomi, she has not turned her back on God. She hasn't turned her back on God. Okay, if you listen to her words, okay, she's still in a relationship with God. She still understands this. She understands that she's still in covenant with God. There's a sense in which she might even feel that she understands that she deserves what she got because she left God's covenant land for the land of other gods. In a sense, leaving the land was in a sense saying God is not going to be faithful to his promises. You know, wanting in a sense to get out. Uh, uh, she maybe thought that God's covenant curses wouldn't follow her to Moab. She's like, no, well, they're going to be stuck here, but there's blessings over here. Let me go where the blessings are at. You know, and she realized that God has testified against her. It's like God has been called to the witness stand. God has been called to the witness stand against her, but she realizes that, that, that what she's gotten, in a sense, has been the justice of God. It's been the discipline of God on her, and, and she's, uh, there's a sense in which she's, um, she's willing to accept that as part of the relationship. So that's important to see. She hasn't left God, okay? Um, she just knows she's under God's curses right now. She's under God's curses. I remember, I remember when God also testified against me. I remember when my whole life crumbled, as it were, when my whole life was swept right underneath my feet. 
I remember the same bitterness that I felt toward God, and I've told some of y'all a little bit of my story. Okay, you know, uh, I remember what I felt. Uh, you know, the the cries of, you know, God, how could you let that happen to me? You know, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but I mean, it wasn't like I was Hitler or anything. You know, <laughs> I wasn't as bad as a lot of other people. You know, but no, I also had to come to the same realization that Naomi did. You know what? God testified against me. God came out and testified against me too. I had to acknowledge the righteousness of God and His justice against me. It wasn't, quote-unquote, life that was hard on Naomi here in, in an ultimate sense. It was God who was hard on her. But she wouldn't deny or turn her back on God. She was still in relationship with Him, even under His discipline. She stuck with God, even in suffering. She didn't bail. And this is so important for all of us. This is super important. Uh, sometimes our suffering, it comes from God. Let's just let's say it, okay? Sometimes our suffering does come from God. Sometimes we do experience God's displeasure. Sometimes we do experience His fatherly discipline, His chastisement. And His discipline hurts, especially when we don't understand it, when it appears to be meaningless when it happens, you know, and especially when we're going through it. Especially when we're going through it. But God disciplines those whom He loves. It's the ones that God leaves on their own and doesn't interact with it. God doesn't show any redemptive love to. The discipline of the Lord is a good thing. It means that He's trying to be a father to you. That He is a father to you. And Ruth knows this. Or Naomi knows this. She knows that through it all, God is still God. And she's able to wish His blessings on her daughters-in-laws. And, and she returns back to the promised land, to God's people. So there's almost, in a sense, in her return, there's almost an act of, uh, you, might, you might want to call it a repentance in some sort of way. She's going back as hard as it's going to be. She's willing to accept, no, I need to go you know, to where God wants me, with his people in the land that he's provided for me. So she goes, and things are about to change for Naomi, though she doesn't know it. Chapter 1 ends on a good note. Okay, It's the beginning of the barley harvest. Good things are coming. So, now regaining hope. As Naomi and Ruth, as they get settled in Judah... Okay, they have to start thinking of basically how are they going to live. Now, apparently, it comes to Naomi uh, and Ruth's attention that there is a kinsman of the clan of Naomi's late husband, Elimelech, who is described for the readers as a worthy man. Okay, which will be uh, revealed to Naomi and Ruth eventually. Okay, his name is Boaz. The reader is alerted that he is a worthy man in uh, chapter two, verse one. But Naomi and Ruth they come to find that uh, eventually or progressively. Ruth takes it upon herself to decide to go into his fields and to glean from the grain so that she can provide sustenance for herself and for Naomi. Now, what is gleaning? Okay, when I first read that, like gleaning, like oh, gleaming, gleaming. No, it's not gleaming, it's gleaning. Okay, the word is mentioned about 12 times in this portion of the narrative, so it's important that we understand what's going on here. What is this gleaning? Okay. In Israel, one of the laws that God gave to the people was that they were to take care of the poor and the widows in the community. One way that the community did this was to let the fatherless, the orphans, or the widows glean in their fields. Okay. Gleaning was essentially picking up what was left over on the ground or on the stalks of grain or other produce of the field. Okay. It was just picking up the leftovers. All right. We see this taught in Deuteronomy 14.29. It says this, it says, And the Levite, because he has no portion or inheritance with you, and the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow who are within your towns, shall come and eat and be filled, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands that you do. Also, Deuteronomy 24, verses 19 through 22. This one's a little bit more uh, explicit. It says, When you reap your harvest in your field and forget a sheaf in the field, you shall not go back to get it. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow, that the Lord your God may bless you in all the work of your hands. When you beat your olive trees, you shall not go over them again. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. When you gather the grapes of your vineyard, you shall not strip it afterward. It shall be for the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt. Therefore, I command you to do this. 
Other laws are mentioned in Leviticus 19, uh, 9 through 10, and 23, 22. Now, these are pretty interesting laws, okay? Basically, they tell you that you kind of have this one shot to go through your field, okay, or to gather your grapes. And whatever you miss, you're supposed to leave it there so that the fatherless, so that the widows, and so that the orphans can get this, okay? Now, on the one hand, these laws, they protected the poor and the needy and those who could not provide for themselves. But this is interesting, too. It wasn't a handout, okay? They had to work for it. They had to go pick it themselves, okay? The command was not here, take to the poor. It was leave for the poor so that they can work, so that they can work. Work was a good thing, okay? No, I'm not making any economical statements about our system or anything, okay? I'm just pointing out the obvious from the text, okay? Now, on the other side, it also protected people from being, uh, uh, from being greedy and promoting, a, uh, it, it, uh, the point of it was also to help promote a spirit of sharing and a, uh, a spirit of providing. Everyone, nowadays basically, you know, it's all about efficiency, you know, you want to uh, uh, milk the cow for all that it's worth, okay, and really maximize profit is the idea of today, basically, okay. Uh, here, uh, Boaz, we should note, He's following the law of God. Okay, he's not doing all this for for harvest or, or, or you know, in a sense, for his own wealth. Okay, he's following the law of God by letting people glean on his field. He's seeking the blessings of God. So Boaz, you know, he, he apparently he uh, he he's been out on business for the day or something, and he's walking over toward his field, uh, and he sees Ruth in his field gleaning, and no doubt he doesn't recognize her. Okay, so he asks one of his servants, "Hey, who's?" Who's that girl? You know, and he answers, Oh, uh, that's some Moabite lady that came back with Naomi from Moab. She asked if she could glean here, and we said, Okay. And she's been going at it pretty hard. You know, she's been going at it since the morning and has only taken a small break. So Boaz, he gets a glimpse of her character just in that description. He gets a glimpse of her character, and so do we. Ruth, she is demonstrating devotion. She's demonstrating devotion to her work. And she's demonstrating devotion to her mother-in-law. Boaz meets her devotion with some devotion of his own. He approaches her and he tells her, Do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Okay? Now, Ruth really doesn't know what to say because uh, uh, you know, uh, Boaz, he's provided for her basically a steady place to get sustenance. Okay? A steady place. She didn't have to go from field to field. He's basically telling her, Always come to this field. Always come to this field. Okay? So she's got a, a place to get steady sustenance. He's provided a sort of security for her in that respect too. Okay? Uh, but also a physical security when he commanded uh, uh, for the, uh, his workers to look after her. Basically stay close to his young women. Okay? To, to those slaves. Uh, if you were a foreigner in that land, again, if you're in a time period too, okay, when everybody does what's right in their own eyes, if you're poor, you don't have a place to stay, you're open, you're open game. Okay? You're open game. And apparently, you know, Boaz is aware that things like that happen. And so he's telling her, no, stay close to my people. My people are, are good. They will take care of you. She's like, you know, uh, she's overwhelmed. You know, she's overwhelmed. Ruth basically says, she says, Why have I found favor in your eyes that you should take notice of me since I am a foreigner? Letting her glean was one thing, but going above and beyond was certainly out of the ordinary, especially because she's a foreigner, and the description there is purposeful. Okay? She's not a sojourner. If you, the laws that I just read, these are for the fatherless, for the widow, okay, for the orphan, and for the sojourner. These are not for foreigners. These were not for foreigners. Sojourners are people that are just passing through, but Ruth, she's not come to just pass through. She's a person who has left all that she has and knows of her home country of Moab. Okay, and yet here she is. Okay, she was a Moabitess though. Okay, and she was showing kindness to an Israelite, to Naomi. And now, an Israelite is showing kindness to a Moabite. Remember the curses in Deuteronomy 23, uh, 2 through 6, uh, upon the Moabite to the 10th generation? Remember that? I'm pretty sure Mo uh, uh, Boaz knew about that. But here he is. Here he is showing kindness to a Moabite woman. Interesting. 
It's almost like the account of Jesus speaking with the woman at the well. In a sense, there's so many social stripes that are really going on here, okay, um, you know, that, that Jesus goes through, in a sense, at least with a woman, you know, to reveal grace. You know, Boaz is now committing social strikes, you know, with a foreigner. You know, it's like, okay, she's not supposed to be here. What's she doing? Boaz, perhaps he's considered Ruth as a sojourner because of her association with Naomi and care for her. But Ruth, she's overwhelmed with his kindness, Okay, maybe even to the point of tears. I, I wouldn't doubt it. I, when I read it, that kind of came out very quickly. So that evening, she finishes up. She has about 22 liters, which is described as an ephah, okay, of barley. She goes to Naomi, and she's overwhelmed with the amount of barley that she brings home. And, and, and Naomi says, Blessed is the man who took notes of you. And Ruth says, the, man, the man's name with whom I worked with today is Boaz. Long silence. Boaz. Boaz. Aha! May he be blessed by the Lord whose kindness has not forsaken the living or the dead, Naomi says. Now, whose kindness? Whose kindness is Naomi talking about here? Is it God's or is it Boaz's kindness? Commentators have noted that the referent of whose is ambiguous and probably intentionally so because it's both. It's both. Boaz is showing, has said here, he is showing loving kindness or covenant faithfulness to Naomi's family through Ruth. But on a grander scale, God is showing Naomi his chesed through Boaz to Ruth to Naomi. There's a lot of stuff going on here. We should consider here, you know, uh, our own kindness. Our own kindness toward other people. You know, God will sometimes use our own acts of kindness to show his kindness to somebody else. Perhaps God has shown you his kindness through someone. You know, if you've ever been uh, down in life and then all of a sudden somebody just, one act of kindness can turn around your day. One act of kindness can turn around your day. That's God's kindness coming through somebody else. It was enough to bring Naomi in one sense back to life. I mean, you know, like Boaz. Boaz. Boaz! You know, she, she comes back to life. She's got some hope. So Naomi, it seems, she, she steps out of her bitterness. She steps out of her self-pity for a moment, and she decides that she needs to be kind once again, and she turns to Ruth and says, My daughter, this is in chapter 3, she says, Should I not seek rest for you that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative? Uh, hint, hint, nudge, nudge. Okay. See Naomi there? Perhaps she knew it before, but she was just too hopeless and too distraught to act. But suddenly, she realized that Boaz is one of her close relatives of the clan of her late husband, Elimelech, and there is hope alive again. Okay, There's hope alive, if not for herself, at least for Ruth. So she tells Ruth, Honey, you get all dolled up and pretty. That is my translation. Okay, Boaz, he'll be at the threshing floor tonight winnowing barley. Okay, when he gets done, you follow him home, and when he lays down to sleep, you go and you uncover his feet and lie down there, and he will tell you what to do after that. So she goes and she does uh, as she's commanded. Boaz is, awo is awoken for whatever reason in the middle of the night. I'm thinking his feet were cold, okay, if you have to ask me. And he's startled that somebody's at his feet, okay? And he's like, you know, oh, who are you? And Ruth answers. She says, I am Ruth, your servant, okay? Now, the word that Ruth uses here is very important. Okay? She is a servant, not a slave servant. And there's a difference. In Ruth 2.13, the, uh, Ruth uses the word shipka, okay? which is slave servant, uh, who cannot have the rights in an Israelite household, uh, uh, including providing an heir. Okay? But here in 3 verse 9, she uses the word amah which is a servant who did have household rights. Okay, So Ruth, she makes a very, very bold move toward Boaz here. She makes a very bold move. Uh, she says, uh, basically in the, in the proposal, she says to him, she says, spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Now, in laying at his feet, the culture of the time understood that to mean that basically she, she was seeking refuge and protection. Okay, that's what she was asking of Boaz. She was asking for refuge and protection through him. Now, this is neat, okay, because if you remember in 2.13, Boaz, when he spoke to Ruth, he said this. He said, The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given to you by the Lord, the God of Israel, 
under whose wings you have come to take refuge. And now Ruth is telling Boaz, spread your wings over me. So Ruth is seeing in Boaz a physical representation of the kindness and protection of God. She's basically telling Boaz in a sense, that blessing that you wanted God to give, I want to see that through you. I want to see that through you. How will Boaz respond to this Moabite? I mean, again, it's one thing okay, to reward kindness with kindness. And Boaz has already gone above and beyond what he should do for this foreigner. Okay, clearly. But his response reveals in the sense that he sold out already to Ruth's kindness. I mean, he could have said, no, I, I can't. Okay, or I won't. Okay, but look at his response. He says, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness, and again, he uses the word has said there, greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether rich or poor. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer, yet there is a redeemer nearer than I. Remain tonight, and in the morning, if he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. So this is, this is really incredible. Okay? Boaz, he falls for her devotion and for her character. Okay? He falls for her devotion and for her character. Her character stands out above all else. Now, I know, and this is why I had to talk about this direction that we weren't going to go, because a lot of people like to use uh, Ruth as this great love story, and in a sense it is, but, uh, but it's not a love story in the sense that how to find love, okay? It's not that kind of love story, okay? And let me just say it, because some of y'all are thinking about it. No, ladies, uncovering a man's feet in the middle of the night will not get you married to him, okay? That is not the way to go about it. That will probably get you... Uh, a police escort and uh, a nice trip to, to jail and all types of other interesting stuff, okay? But uh, uh, there is something to see here in that good character attracts good character and repels the bad ones, okay? Good character attracts good character and it repels bad ones. Ruth's character is part of what kept her from seeking a quick satisfaction with anyone who could provide security. That's when Boaz says, you know, you know, blessed are you. You didn't run off to seek the young men. That is, you didn't try to find a, you know, a, a quick husband you know, to basically go and get the security that I know that you need. You know, he's like, no, you worked and you decided to stay devoted to Naomi. You, and you, you showed it by working from morning all the way till the night. And your work, you know, it really paid off. And, and you know, that's what attracted Boaz. Likewise, Boaz, he's attracted to the character of Ruth because she reflects his own character of devotion and kindness. They weren't primarily attracted to each other because of looks or for mere, uh, mere self-seeking purposes. Okay, or what they could add to each other, because each of them, in a way, they reflected a characteristic of God. In particular, they reflected God's has said, his loving kindness. Boaz, basically, he says this, he says, Your kindness to Naomi and your dead husband, even now, still continues. And this kindness to them, in seeking the redemption of their inheritance and their name, surpasses your first kindness of leaving your homeland to take care of Naomi, your mother-in-law that you were by no means obligated to take care of. I mean, he, uh, Boaz is floored. <laughs> you know, he just keeps seeing more kindness and more kindness. He's like, okay, yeah, you left home. Man, that's, that's something else. Wow, you've been working for Naomi to provide for you and for her. Awesome. You know, and then now, you know, in coming to, in coming to him uh, as a kinsman redeemer, She's uh, Ruth is still showing faithfulness, in a sense, to her dead husband, trying to perpetuate the family name. That is, she didn't just want their line to end right there. You know, and, and that's what got Boaz. He's like, wow, you just, it, it's just the kindness just keeps coming. It keeps coming. There's, there are no end to it. I, you know, he's in love with her kindness. Let's just put it that way. I can't state that any stronger. I don't want to belabor the point. Uh, because it's not the main point of the book, but it's worth noting how Boaz, he made his choice for Ruth as a wife and, and, uh, and what means Ruth used to win Boaz's heart, namely her character. It wasn't her sexuality as is common today. So, as hope is alive and love is in the air, 
Boaz, true to his character, he wants to do what is right. He knows that there's another redeemer ahead of him, and he's not willing to sidestep the law of God for love. Okay, how different uh, that is today too. When basically, you know, usually sex comes first before, even before love. Sometimes, you know, much less thoughts about God's law. You know, where men and women today are quick to rush into intimacy, Boaz is quick to rush to obedience. Something that we should think about when choosing a mate and the quality of their character. Not, uh, not the build of their body, uh, the bills in their wallet, or the good times we can have with them. Certainly, uh, those are not to be disregarded. I mean, you want to have some sort of attraction, but those, those things will only take you so far. They'll only take you so far. So, in the morning, Boaz, he seeks out the other closer redeemer, and he pulls him aside. and like, hey man, can I talk to you for a minute, please? You know, sure, my friend, what's up? You know, and hold on, let me just get some of the other men who need to hear what I have to say. And Boaz, he conducts business at the city gate, okay, and he gathers ten of the elders of the city so that they can act as witnesses for what's about to take place. And he says this, he says, Naomi has come back from the country of Moab. This is in four, uh, verses three through four. Naomi has come back from the country of Moab. She's selling a parcel of land that belonged to our relative Elimelech. So I thought I would tell you of it and say, buy it in the presence of those sitting here and in the presence of the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not, tell me that I may know. For there is not uh, uh, none besides you to redeem it, and I, uh, and I come after you. Now, who wouldn't want the deal that's proposed here? Okay, the Redeemer, he basically stands to gain a piece of land that would be added to his own inheritance. Okay, Naomi is too old to have children, uh, so he's probably thinking, oh, well, there's not going to be an extra heir to divide the land amongst. You know, this is a win-win situation. You know, it's a win for Naomi. Uh, you know, she gets a, a protection. She gets a house to live in. Okay, and it's a win for this kinsman redeemer. He gets more land so that he can split amongst his own kids. Okay, he's ready to follow God's law and to do his duties as the Goel. Okay, as the kinsman redeemer. Or is he? Or is he? In Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 10, it makes it clear that this, uh, this is a duty that must be undertaken, or else the one who will not undertake the duty is to be shamed by the wife of the dead in front of the entire town. So as he's ready to fulfill God's law, you know, he then hears, uh, he hears from Boaz. He says, you know, he's like, okay, I'll take it. Yeah, heck yeah, I'll take it. And then Boaz says, but... The day that you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you also acquire Ruth the Moabite, the widow of the dead, in order to perpetuate the name of the dead in his inheritance. And upon hearing this, basically upon, upon hearing, wait, I'm going to have to have a kid. I'm going to have to divide my inheritance into more, you know, into more, uh, into more portions. But wait, that's going to cut into the inheritance for my own kids, from my own line. Hmm. Wait, wait a minute. Okay, look. And he's basically reasonably like, look, maybe I spoke a bit too rashly, okay, but I don't think I can do this. He's not willing to cut into the inheritance of his own children. There's, this, there's a sense of selfishness now that comes out here. He's not willing to redeem Naomi if she comes, uh, if she comes with Ruth because then he's going to have to provide an heir for them there. Basically, it's going to cost him in the end to redeem Naomi, and he's not willing to pay that price. In order to redeem Naomi, it would mean taking Ruth, the foreigner. It would mean taking upon himself their poverty, their conditions, their hopelessness, their insecurity, and bring them into his own security, to bring them into his own wealth, and to bring them into his own abundance. The first redeemer, he is not willing to sacrifice himself to redeem Naomi or Ruth, but Boaz Boaz, he's willing to take upon himself the hopelessness of Naomi and to give her hope. He's willing to take the foreigner Ruth and to bring her into the fold of God. He's willing to give up his own inheritance to share it with Ruth and Naomi. Boaz, he tells the elders that he will redeem it and her uh, and, her, and all the men agree and they legalize everything. The blessing that they give out is a rather interesting one. They say this, they say, May the Lord make the woman who is coming into your house like Rachel and Leah, who together built up the house of Israel. May you act worthily in Ephrathah 
and be renowned in Bethlehem, and may your house be like the house of Perez. Down here we say Betis, but that's Perez, okay? <laughs> Whom Tamar bore to Judah, because of the offspring that the Lord will give you by this young woman. Now, there are some very interesting characters here. Rachel and Leah, these were both wives of Jacob, who eventually gave Jacob his twelve sons. But the house of Perez, if you recall, Perez is the son of Judah, who was born through Judah's daughter-in-law. Okay? Who was born through Judah's daughter-in-law, who was refused the Levirate marriage by Judah, and sl she slept with Judah to perpetuate the name of the family. Okay? Basically, she slept, she slept with her father-in-law. Okay? Let's just put it that way. She slept with her father-in-law in order to fulfill the obligations of, uh, of continuing on the family name, since Judah was not willing to give her uh, uh, the other son that he had, I forget his name, but he was being selfish. He was being selfish. And this is interesting, you know, the blessing of Perez, you know, and basically what, what this is, is God's grace, uh, on, on all these characters, God's grace was upon all these women and their offspring. Judah had to realize, no, you know what, she's more righteous than I am. The blessing is one of God's grace to people who didn't deserve it at all. That's what these men are saying in, in calling out the names of all these women, especially of Perez. May God grant her the blessing from a, you know, a person who doesn't deserve it. May God grant it to her. So as Ruth and Boaz, they bear a son together, now the camera comes back, okay, and we're back on Naomi, the bitter one, okay, the hopeless one, but now, this time, she's blessed. The woman tell her, Blessed be the Lord, who has not left you this day without a Redeemer, and may his name be renowned in all Israel. He shall be to you, and they're speaking of the son here, okay, he shall be to you a restorer of life and a nourisher of your old age. That's uh, chapter 4, verses 14 through 15. The child's name was Obed. He was, to Naomi, a, a sort of savior. Okay? He was like a saving grace to her. Okay? She became a grandma. Okay? She became a grandma. The book concludes that Obed fathered Jesse, and Jesse fathered David, who would become the great king of Israel. He would become the ideal king of Israel. Now, let me, let me tie some stuff up here. Okay? The book of Ruth, it's about God's hesed. Okay, but not only to Naomi, but to all of his covenant people. Recall the promise of Genesis 3.15 that the seed of the woman, okay, recall that promise. Recall what time period we're in. We're in the time period of the judges, which is the backdrop for the book of Ruth. Okay, the question that's being begged in a sense is, where is the seed? Where is the seed? Remember judges, Israel's going to hell in a handbasket in a sense, okay? You read the last account, the Benjamites. Okay, and what they did to the concubine, to, to, uh, to the concubine of the Levite. Bad times. Where is the seed? Where is the seed? Where, where is this promise? We know that it will be through Judah. Okay, but even in Judah, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Even amongst the people like this, God's covenant faithfulness endures forever. His covenant faithfulness is demonstrated in providing the lineage of the seed of the woman as we see the line narrowed down even further. So here, David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, this ultimately is pointing us to the greater David, Jesus Christ, the true hope of Israel. He is the true child that restored Naomi's hope and brought her to life again. But more than this, the function of Boaz as the kinsman redeemer, this points us to the sacrifice that Jesus would have to make in order to redeem us. You see, in order for Boaz to love and to marry Ruth, in order for him to redeem her and Naomi, it was going to cost him. It was going to cost him if he was going to redeem them. But the sacrifice that he made, it, it was a mere pointer to the sacrifice that Jesus would ultimately make on the cross. And on the cross, Jesus Christ, he took upon himself our own poverty of spirit. On the cross, He took our hopelessness. He took our bitterness. He took our shame. He took upon Himself our very sins as though they were His very own. On the cross, Jesus Christ, He absorbed into Himself all, the, uh, all, that, uh, all of the wrath of God, all of the ugliness of sin. 
all the, the death that it brings, all the tragedy, all the tears, Jesus Christ absorbed all of that into himself. Don't you see? It cost Jesus everything to love you. It cost Jesus Christ everything to redeem us. It cost him his whole life. It cost God his only son to love you. No other religion can claim this at all. You ask any other religion, you ask their God, what did it cost you to love me? They can't answer. They can't answer. You ask Islam, what did it cost you to love me? Allah just sits up there and asks you to submit to him. That's it. Doesn't cost him anything. In Christ, we, we see a God who is willing and who did give everything just to love us. In Christianity alone, God paid the ultimate price on the cross to show you his love. The Apostle John, he said, And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. 1 John 4.10 in Jesus, we see the true and the greater Boaz. He is the worthy man who kept all of God's laws, every jot and tittle. Jesus Christ alone, he was perfect in his life and in his sacrifice. In conclusion, my friends, perhaps you are like Naomi or Ruth a little. Perhaps you've been hit so hard by life that you feel bitter, no hope. Everything, everything that you see is through the lens of just suffering and pain. Maybe you're an outsider to God's people like Ruth too. You've been around people, you know, the, the church before. You've seen them. You may have come to church with them. You may have simply been gleaning in a sense from Christian blessings but have not become part of the covenant people yourself. My friends, God comes to you. He comes to us, to the hopeless to the destitute in spirit, the poor in spirit, the ones who are lacking righteousness. And he says to us, he says, I will be your redeemer. See what I did on the cross. There, there I give hope to the hopeless. There on the cross, the emptiness that was yours, I became that. Jesus can say, I emptied myself so that I could give the fullness of my life to you. Don't look to false redeemers like Ruth could have. She could have bailed. She could have gone to something that was, that was very quick. Don't look to the false redeemers, the other young men. She could have turned to worldly security like riches, like sex, like power, like a career, uh, all these other gods and these idols. But the kindness of God, the kindness of God was more attractive as it was displayed in Boaz. The chesed of the Lord is fully on display on the cross. There all the covenant promises come to fulfillment. In Jesus Christ, there is hope again. In Jesus, we can stop wondering. In Jesus, we can find rest. In Jesus, there is life. In Jesus, there we find a restorer of life. See what he gave. Look on his beauty. And yes, call it that. Look on the beauty of the Lord. See what it cost him to love. It cost him his own life. In Jesus, behold the loving kindness, the chesed, of the Lord, not merely to Naomi or Ruth, but to all who trust in Him. Amen.